Sun Tzu famously said, the line between disorder and order lies in logistics. Such was the case of the 29th century, where the chaos in the aftermath of the anti-Messer revolution nearly destroyed the new UAE government. With the collapse of ship manufacturers and a tanking economy, a logistical crisis threatened to undo everything the revolutionaries had fought for. It was until five companies would rescue the government from the brink of disaster. My name is Paul Shelley, and welcome to The Astro Historian. This is a channel dedicated to exploring and explaining the lore of sci-fi and space universes and discussing their impact. Today we'll be looking at the universe of Star Citizen and talking about an issue which I often mention but have rarely directly addressed of the 29th century, what I've dubbed the Cargo Crisis. Now, it's important to note that this period has never been directly referenced or called by any one name. However, through many different sources, we can see what was going on during the early part of the 29th century. So this video is going to be stitching together several sources to tell a full story of what I believe the writers were intending with this crisis in the verse's history. As a result, I will be adding references to all the sources used in this video in the description, so you can check out these sources and decide for yourself. With that said, let's talk about what was likely one of the most impactful events in modern UEE history. This all began on May 3rd, 2792, when the newly appointed Imperator, Aaron Toy, announced the arrest of the last Messer Imperator, Linton Messer, after revolutionary forces, likely backed by the Senate and the military, broke into the Imperial Palace, ending the 22-day violent uprising, which would become known as the Anti-Messer Revolution. Directly in the aftermath, it seemed the majority of the UEE was now under the direct control of the Senate and the newly appointed Imperator. This new government went to work bringing sympathizers and allies of the Messer government to justice, during this time accusing a person or group of being Meserites or having been part of the Messer regime became a popular means to oust one's enemies or rivals. As a result, many who worked at Messer loyalist-owned companies simply disappeared. One example was famed ship designer and weapons manufacturer Juliet Malpin, who managed to bury her connection to the Messers and flee to Corel to start a new life. Heck, even Linton's own sister, Fiona Messer, was able to disappear and leave no trace. These factors likely led to what would be the true cause of what I have dubbed the cargo crisis, the dissolution or collapse of companies which were vital to the infrastructure and logistics of the UEE, and everyone from CEOs to line employees burning records and fleeing, taking advantage of the chaos of the aftermath of the revolution to avoid prosecution or even mob justice for their role in the hated Messer regime. The issue with this naive attempt to bring Messer loyalists to justice is that, based on how the Messers worked, if you wanted to do business in the UEE, it was very hard not to work with the Messers. Thus, likely the vast majority of companies in the UEE had some connection to the Messers if they were sizable in any way. Companies like Anvil and Origin had some connections to the Linton Messer regime, making ships and parts for them. Even the giant that is RSI had to play ball with the Messer regime in order to stay in business, bowing to the demands of the government when RSI even slightly annoyed the Messers. So it's very likely that almost every manufacturer of everything from parts to capital ships was in bed with the Messers to some degree, meaning they were all vulnerable to the backlash from the revolutionaries. While those three companies I mentioned earlier were eventually spared, they were highly scrutinized and nearly suffered the fate of many other manufacturers. So as you can see, this reaction would have both immediate and long-lasting effects. The immediate effect was an economy in shambles by 2793. It grew so bad that many companies that had been spared the torch began to secretly lobby the new government to slow down or stop planned changes to the government which the revolutionaries had fought for, in fear that it would cause an economic depression. The fears of the people and the corporations of an economic collapse would win out, and lead to a half-finished reformation of the old UEE government. This likely saved the economy for the rest of the decade, but it still only limped along afterwards, unable to build the speed it needed to in order to recover. This is likely due to the lack of companies making new cargo ships or parts 
for aging cargo ships, deliveries often being delayed or never making their destination at all. This slow rolling failure of civilian logistical infrastructure would eventually lead to the passage of the first Surplus Act in 2801, which authorized every class of military ship up to destroyer class to be made available to purchase by civilians. This was said to be mostly a means to allow the sale of military freighters, a stopgap to handle the immediate issues of the lack of transports after the fall of the Messers. This should highlight just how bad the situation was with civilian logistics. However, it was a situation that didn't go unnoticed. Musashi Industrial and Starflight Concern was the earliest and most important player during the start of the cargo crisis. It was formed in 2805 out of the merger of Hato Electronics Corporation and the Musashi Lifestyle Design Unit, which was a spin-off of Acorn Limited. The principal ship which would lead to the solution of this growing problem was the Misk Hull series. However, it is said that the whole series first launched in 2802, three years before the formation of MISC. It's just my supposition, but given the date, I think the whole series was designed by Musashi, who didn't have the facilities to produce the whole series in the numbers that were needed to take advantage of the crisis. So they turned to the failing Hato Electronics Corporation to use their huge network of production facilities to build these new freighters. The whole series quickly revolutionized interstellar freight, leading to the standardization of dockyards and cargo processes around the UEE. This is most evident in the standard SCU boxes, which worked with the various whole series, which are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 24, and 32 respectively. This led to long-ranging knock-on effects, including over a dozen outside companies being founded or significantly shifting focus to support the whole design including Argo Astronautics, who adapted their legendary MPUV to become a cargo shuttle for the whole series. While the whole series would help start the process of solving the cargo crisis, it was only a single company, and a new one at that. Despite the quick ascendance of the whole series to prominence in the early 29th century, problems with shipment delays and relief aid to far-off stricken worlds persisted. There just weren't enough ships to move cargo. In fact, by 2812, even modified and civilian-owned Idris frigates were being used as shielded cargo ships to deliver aid to the Corel system, where solar flares had caused massive crop failures in the system. Truly, it was a desperate move for a desperate time. This would lead to the second major player in the solution to the crisis to enter the stage. August Dunlow had founded Crusader Industries out of Seraphim Systems in 2799. A former revolutionary and government worker, Dunlow used his connections to sell short-range shuttles to the UEE. However, by the early 29th century, Crusader was experiencing significant delays of parts and materials to their factories and their ships to market. During a conference call to Dunlow in 2812, a frustrated Axel Adamson, who was the warehouse manager for Crusader at the time, explained, If we had our own fleet, I guarantee this wouldn't happen. This statement got Dunlow thinking, and after a cost analysis, he realized that they could build their own fleet of transports to improve their own efficiency. Thus, the first heavy hauling ship by Crusader, the Crusader Jupiter, was created. The military, whose reserves of freighters were likely now drained by the first surplus act, saw the Jupiter as a solution to their problems. It was adopted by the UEE Army, which marked the start of a long relationship between the UEE and Crusader when it came to military transports. When Starlift Command was formed to improve the reaction to incidents in the UEE, as well as be in charge of moving troops, material, and cargo into hostile zones, Crusader Industries was selected again to help. The M2 Starlifter, built in 2814, became the standard transport for the UEE military, and remains so to this day replacing a lot of the freighters which were sold off with the Surplus Act. This would lead to a standardization of vehicle sizes in the UEE. As this ship was designed to be able to transport several Nova or Storm-class tanks to the battlefield. As a result, pretty much all vehicles have had the restriction of being able to at least fit in a Hercules if they are to be used by the UEE military. This has trickled down to the civilian market as well, meaning just about all modern ground vehicles are designed to fit in this class of ship. While both of these companies were helping to rebuild the logistical structure of the UEE by the early 29th century, 
other companies were also throwing their hat into the ring, after seeing the success of both MISC and Crusader. Specifically, the granddaddy of all modern spaceships, RSI, and a former engine manufacturer turned budding ship designer known as Origin Jumpworks. In the early 28th century, RSI had been without significant military contracts for about a century, having been supplanted by Aegis Dynamics. They also had started their modernization programs, with the Aurora being released in 2659 to great success. So they started to develop a larger platform, which allowed for the average space pilot to do just about everything dubbed the Constellation series. It proved to be very popular, though significantly more expensive than their new Aurora starter line. In a quest to improve the design and drop the price, they made the Mark II version of the ship sometime in the late 28th and early 29th century. Then in 2815, RSI began to develop what they deemed the Connie Light, a budget edition of the Constellation which would trade some of the more advanced capabilities for a significantly lower price point. Development of the ship was slow but steady, taking roughly three years from the initial budgeting to the first prototype. It took the then-standard Constellation Mark II hull and carefully removed or replaced nearly all of the internal components until the total unit cost had been cut by 35%. But due to a failure of marketing, the ship was a flop, with critics calling it the Connie Jr. or the Connie Plastic to deride it as a lower quality ship not worth the price. In 2828, a new team took a shot at this budget Connie, and through their work, they realized that what they had created wasn't just a cheaper version of the ship, but a Connie that was better at doing something already in high demand at the time, hauling cargo. By 2836, the new version of the Connie was released, dubbed the Constellation Taurus. This time, it worked, with customers flocking to the new cargo ship. Heavy sales of the first Constellation Taurus model were assisted by another company's misery. You see, MISC's vaunted hull series, which was the favorite of the shipping industry at the time, was briefly grounded after a software failure caused three separate instances in which hull B spacecraft crashed during their automatic docking procedures. No lives were lost, but several million credits worth of cargo was destroyed, including one incident in which a collision caused the containers of plastic toys to spill and disable an entire shipping hub for two days. Imagery of the incident showing space-suited yard workers collecting tiny doll torsos with EVA equipment embarrassed all involved and continue to circle to this day, much to Masashi's chagrin. As a result, smaller haulers were keenly interested in a ship that stores containers internally, and the cheapest and most efficient on the market was the Connie Taurus. Many freight lines scrambled to purchase and boast about their own fleets of the new RSI ship. In the years that followed, RSI's reputation for solid, reliable spacecraft would continue to apply to the Taurus, leading to steady sales. It also led to expanded interest in freighters with internal cargo bays, a trend which has continued to this very day. Origin Jumpworks would throw their hat into the ring around the same time as the Taurus launched. While it isn't clear exactly when, it is known that sometime before 2844, Origin made their first step into the ship market with the 600. This is likely in response to both the grounding of the whole series and the great success of their longtime customer, RSI, with the Taurus. While you may be familiar with the 600i, it is slightly different from the 600. The 600i is a luxury revamped version of the old hauler, which used the same exterior hull and entirely redid the interior. The 600 was a mid-sized transport, which utilized an internal and pressurized cargo bay. This pressurized cargo bay was likely its major selling point, taking advantage of MISC's embarrassing failures with the whole series. The 600 almost assuredly had a larger internal cargo capacity than the Taurus, but also likely had a higher price tag. By the 2840s, these 600s did eventually find their way into the secondhand market, and were likely beginning to be phased out. However, the 600 did allow Origin practice on how to make ships, and help provide funds to begin work on other projects, like their massive 890 jump. By the late 29th century, it seemed that at least the major star systems of the UEE and the military had solved their logistics issues. 
However, there was one group of people who seemed to still struggle with getting shipments on time or even arriving at all, the less developed systems of the UEE. This was due to the distance and danger often associated with delivering to these remote systems, as well as the expensive cost of maintaining fleets on the edge of human space. To solve this issue, another new company would step up to tackle the last vestiges of the cargo crisis. In 2845, a group of engineers failed their bid to win a UEE military contract. Believing their design still had value for the market, they decided to form Drake Interplanetary to sell their new AS-1 Cutlass. The Cutlass proved to be a huge hit, and by the end of the 29th century, the company's CEO and founder, Jan Dredge, was looking to diversify their lineup. While the Cutlasses had proved effective as small, short-range haulers on the frontier, it was more well-known for its combat abilities. Dredge decided that it would be good for them to make something less combat-oriented to improve their floundering image of the Cutlasses, which had become the new favorite tool of pirates all over the Empire. Thus, at IAE 2871, the Caterpillar was unveiled to the public, with mixed responses. Its old design was a turnoff for many who first saw it, with one reviewer remarking they had never seen a brand new ship that looked 30 years old, but the modularity of its hull and the incredibly cheap cost for its abilities quickly turned heads. The Caterpillar seems to be one of the first civilian ships to be explicitly modular, offering their customers a highly versatile cargo ship which could transform into anything the owner might need as long as they had the right modules. Coupled with its low asking price, it quickly became popular with many cargo fleets, including Kovalec Shipping, one of the darlings of transport on the frontier. It may even be responsible for the many modular ship designs we see today, like the RSI Galaxy. Thus, by the turn of the 30th century, the last vestiges of the cargo crisis of the 29th century were almost entirely wiped away, mostly thanks to five companies who turned the crisis into thriving businesses. While Origin has long since left the industrial hauling market, Misk, Crusader, RSI, and Drake continue to dominate the market, becoming household names and some of the most powerful corporations in the UEE. It's very likely that without these companies, the UEE might have fallen apart, with systems being cut off from supplies and support from the UEE, many might have decided to strike it out on their own. At the same time, without the crisis, MISC, Crusader, RSI, Origin, and Drake might have never become the juggernauts of industry they are today. We are still experiencing the side effects of this crisis in 2953. All stations and landing zones use these standard cargo unit containers popularized by the whole series. Military vehicles must be designed to fit in at least the standards of the Crusader Hercules Starlifter. RSI's popularization of larger internal cargo bay ships has birthed an entire new market for similar style ships of every size. And modularization has become almost standard for many companies in the verse, made popular by the Caterpillar. We have yet to see the full extent of the impact of the cargo crisis on the UEE, as new lore is released about this time period in history. Regardless, it is likely to continue to be an important pivotal point in the history of space travel. I'd like to thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, think about hitting that like button, subscribing for more content, and hitting the bell icon to be notified when these release. I'd also like to thank those on screen now for supporting the channel financially. If you want to throw a few credits, think about becoming a member on YouTube, and if you want a bit more for your contribution, join the Ko-fi or Patreon. Patreons and Ko-fi members get early, ad-free access to all videos, including exclusive early access to my long-running Complete History of Star Citizen lore series. Check those out now in the top right if you want to know what you're getting. Now, I want to hear your thoughts on the cargo crisis and any other lore topics in the comments below. And as always, remember, Existoria Ad Astra.